This screencast is being provided to help you go through The Brook by Alfred Lord Tennyson, who, as you can see, lived in the 1800s. He was a Victorian poet um, who's, who had many friends who were Romantic poets, but the Romantic poets were kind of on the going outside, and he was kind of on the going inside to the Victorians. So I guess you could say Alfred Lord Tennyson straddled those groups a little bit. I thought it was interesting to find a quote such as the one on the top right-hand corner. It seemed like he predicted Facebook, for heaven's sakes. Guard your roving thoughts with a jealous care, for speech is but the dialer of thoughts, and every fool can plainly read in your words what is the hour of your thoughts. I guess a few of us could probably stand to zip our lips a little more, hmm? Okay, well now that we're going to go through the poem, Let's just take a quick peek at Alfred Lord Tennyson in the early days and then in the later days. He was actually one of the greatest poets of the English language. He was very, very famous. And if you've read his poem recently, The Eagle, um, you, would, you would know why. It's a wonderful poem. He was named the Poet Laureate of England in 1850, something that had been going on in England since at least 1616, where the monarch, the king or queen, would choose a poet who would get a like a stipend, a, an allowance basically, to be the monarch's poet and would write poems for any occasion that he or she wanted to mark. Being a poet laureate is something that can even happen in America. Every year the Library of Congress selects a poet to be the poet laureate of the United States for a year and that person goes around again to raise awareness of poetry, to speak at dinners, to meet with groups of poets, and really the organization highlights that poet's work. Maya Lou Angelou, um, the Rita Dove, Billy Collins, Robert Frost, these have all been poet laureates of the United States. Now, if you are on the actual PowerPoint version of this, you'd be able to watch the YouTube video that goes along with this. So if you want to listen to the poem with someone else reading it, go ahead and go to that and listen to it and come back. If not, then you can just listen while I read it. The Brook. And try to pay attention to the, the words that are in yellow and underlined. You'll see the definitions down below. I'll try to go over them, but I don't want to interrupt the flow of the poem too much. I come from haunts of Coot and Hearn. I make a sudden sally and sparkle out among the fern to bicker down a valley. Interesting use of some verbs there, right? By thirty hills I hurry down or slip between the ridges, by twenty thorps a little town and half a hundred bridges, till last by Philip's farm I flow to join the brimming river, for men may come and men may go, but I go on forever. I chatter over stony ways in little sharps and trebles. I bubble into eddying bays. I babble on the pebbles. With many a curve my banks I fret by many a field and fallow, and many a fairy foreland set with willow weed and mallow. I chatter, chatter as I flow to join the brimming river, for men may come and men may go, but I go on forever. I wind about and in and out, with here a blossom sailing, and here and there a lusty trout, and here and there a grayling, and here and there a foamy flake upon me as I travel, with many a silvery water break above the golden gravel, and draw them all along, and flow to join the brimming river, for men may come and men may go, but I go on forever. I steal by lawns and grassy plots, I slide by hazel covers, I move the sweet forget-me-nots that grow for happy lovers. I slip, I slide, I glue my glance among my skimming swallows, I make the netted sunbeam dance against my sandy shallows. I murmur under moon and stars in brambly wildernesses, I linger by my shingly bars, I loiter round my cresses. And out again I curve and flow to join the brimming river, for men may come and men may go, but I go on forever. So before we go into the questions that come at the end of the poem, I'd like to go back to each stanza for just a moment and point out a couple of things. In stanza one, we have some different vocabulary words like haunts. I was going to say, if I, were, if I was going to my class reunion, I may say, oh, 
I went to Kent State and visited my old haunts. That would just mean places that I used to go. Coot and Hearn are both aquatic birds, and if you sally somewhere, you leap forward. Now the brook sallies, and it sparkles, and it bickers. And so I think you've probably learned from the poem that the I in the poem is the brook. And so what literary vocabulary word can you use when we're comparing something that's not exactly human or alive to something living? That's right, it's personification. So the entire poem is really a personification, and the speaker, I, is indeed the brook. Now, 30 hills right here, this is an example of assonance. You can see the I in 30 and the I in hills, and you can hear them. So we're not going to pick out every instance of assonance, but that's an example of it here. Now, you can probably see that we have some alliteration, 20 thorps, and we have half a hundred. We have hills and hurry. We have Phillips, farm, flow. We have our men may and men may. Okay, so we have a lot of alliteration in the poem. Uh, we also can see a little bit of uh, a refrain going on, something that repeats. So what repeats in this poem is the word flow at the end of this line, and then to join the brimming river, for men may come and men may go, but I go on forever. So this part of the line will be different in each one, but it will end with I flow. So you might watch for that as we continue our, our way through the poem and think about the refrain or the repeated chorus and what that might mean. Now you'll see in this line, I chatter, you'll see bubble and babble and even more chattering. So you might consider what is a literary device word that means that the word sounds the way that the word is meant to sound. If you've come up with the word onomatopoeia, then you are indeed correct. Chatter, bubble, babble, those are all examples of onomatopoeia. Now we have some audio imagery in this stanza and stanza four, whereas normally we have a lot of visual imagery here you can hear the chattering over the stones. Sharps and trebles are musical designations. Bubbling, babbling on the pebbles. Bubble, babble, and pebble also, you'll notice, have that repeated double B in them. So bubble, babble, pebbles is an example of what we call consonants, when you can have a consonant sound repeated in a word, and if it's at the beginning of the word, it's alliteration. But if it's in anywhere else in the word, like in the middle or the end, then we call it consonants. So you'll notice here that we also have some consonants in willow and mallow and fallow, too, if you'd like to add that. We have a lot of it alliteration with fret, field, fallow, fairy, and foreland. So we can stop for a moment to appreciate what that does for the poem. So again, we have our chattering and chattering, and that's our onomatopoeia. And then we continue with our refrain, which is, Flow to join the brimming river, for men may come and men may go, but I go on forever. Stanzas 7 through 9 take us back to see our visual imagery and where the, where the brook is going and what we can see along the way. And then we have our refrain again. Stanzas 10 and 11 continue to take this journey along with the, with the brook. And we can see the flowers and the, we even can see the motion of it. So here we have even a tactile or kinesthetic imagery, slipping and sliding, glooming and glancing, and making the netted sunbeams dance. And again, some more alliteration with slip, slide, gloom, glance, sandy, and shallows. Okay, more alliteration here with murmur and moon. And we have some linger and loitering. And again, we have our refrain to finish up the poem. So now that we've taken a deeper look at the literary devices, we'll go on to our questions. Now, we've already answered several of these, so we'll zip by a few of them. I would point out that in the first question, there's only one word that doesn't mean what the other three mean. So that would be your clue that C, eternal, is the correct answer. Question two is a little harder, though. When the poet's drawing a parallel between the journey of the brook and... 
which ones can it not be? If you've answered D, absolutely correct, that's silly. C, no, it really isn't talking about the difficulties in a man's life. If we look at A and B, I think we're a lot closer there. So the existence of man, the uh, way that man goes on, so those will be those will be something that we would look at. Now who narrates the poem? We've already decided that the answer is C, the brook. And the figure of speech because of this is a personification, although the poem does contain extended metaphor. We talked already about the I being the brook. How does it chatter? And what is what do these two lines mean? For men may come and men may go, but I go on forever. We'll come back to that in a moment. Now we looked, we did not look at the poem's rhyme scheme, but if you go back to the first slide, you'll see that it is A, B, A, B. And every other line continues to rhyme throughout the entire poem, giving it a nice rhythm of its own. We looked at alliteration, we looked at onomatopoeia, we looked at consonants, assonance, and um, some other literary devices along the way there as well. So the last part to really talk about is how is the poem not only personification but an extended metaphor? How is the journey of the brook being compared and contrasted with the journey of life? Um, may want to take a few moments now to think about a theme for the poem and to try to support it with some evidence. Our novel connection is to think about El Patron. Now we have our facts on the right side here. Now we just want to take a few moments to think about El Patron going on forever and ever. Is he more like the brook or is he more like humankind? We'll be discussing that in the future. I hope you had a wonderful experience with the PowerPoint. I've enjoyed this poem a lot, especially the more I've read it. So take a listen to it or come back over it a couple of times and you're sure to get even more out of it. Thank you.